thank you for joining us today. So happy to have you today on this segment of Tech Beat, where leaders learn, innovate, and grow with my esteemed friend and guest, Basam Salem. So happy to have you on today. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Earl. Yes, of course. We're going to come back to Basam in just a moment, but I do want to provide a few announcements and I need to pull up my cheat sheet if that's all right. So first of all, my name is Earl Foote. I am founder, CEO of Nexus IT. Nexus IT is a white glove outsourced IT support and cybersecurity services firm based here in Northern Utah and servicing a nationwide footprint. Nexus IT takes IT and cybersecurity off the plates of business leaders so they can fo focus on building their businesses and growing them instead of the intricacies of technology behind the scenes. Let's see, I did wanna let everybody know that TechBeat is now on Spotify, on Apple, iHeartRadio, Google, and Pandora, and all of the other major podcast platforms. We do encourage and we would love your support there. Go subscribe. You can listen to TechBeat now in audio format or in video on any of those platforms, anywhere you are. Also, we will have some questions, a question and answer throughout the hour and at the end of the hour. So feel free, whatever platform you're joining us from, type your comments and questions into those platforms in the comments sections. We will get to as much as we can throughout the hour and at the end of the hour as well. We appreciate your support and your engagement. I did wanna just update everybody on some upcoming episodes on TechBeat, some really great promising leaders that we have coming up, including James Jensen, the founder CEO of Jump, who is also the creator of The Void. He'll be joining us in August. I also have a special segment with Jake Hilliard and Eric Sessions from Intellitex. We're excited to have them join us here at the end of August. Garrett Clark and John Bowers from Silicon Slopes will be joining me in September. Tara Spaulding, the Managing Director of Boom Startup, and Sid Tetro, the CEO of Brandless, are all joining us here on TechBeat in the coming months. So keep an eye out for announcements around those segments. All right, let's get to the man of the hour. But let me tell you just a little bit about Bassam quickly. Uh, Bassam Salam, Bassam Salem, I'm sorry, oh, I will, I will I, get my I take my vowels. Close <laughs> works for me. I struggle a little bit because I do speak three languages and the way you pronounce those vowels in those languages are different than in English. And so sometimes and, I, with international names, I infer. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> Salem sounds so normal. Yeah, yeah. Salem sounds yeah, so much yeah, cooler. Yeah. So. I, I lived in Salem, Massachusetts. So there there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I just got to remember. You know? <laughs> but Sam Salem started his entrepreneurial journey by founding startup consultancy Mindshare Ventures following following Followed in early 2016 with the founding of Atlas RTX, the first company incubated within the Mindshare Ventures framework. Uh, the company now supports some of the world's most successful enterprises, from seven of the top uh, 20 home builders in the United States, to tech companies such as HPE and Instructure, to some of the world's most prominent higher education institutions, including Purdue University and Vanderbilt uh, University. All right. So... Sam, my friend, again, thank you so much yeah, for thank you. joining me. It's a me pleasure, and it's down. nice to be in Park City. It's yeah. fantastic. Yes. In fact, your offices are really, literally just a block Three away. Three minutes away. Yeah. I'm embarrassed that I drove. I just You didn't over. bring your e-bike in today. I yeah. Should have. Yeah, I know that's one of your hobbies, one of the things you love to do. I, I love that in the summer. I've discovered that allergies can take me down for a few weeks. So I think we're coming out of that that season for me, and I'm excited to go back to it. Very cool. Awesome. By the way, we're, we're joining you from the atrium at Kiln Park City. Super happy to have Kiln always as a partner and obviously a really cool space here that we're in. But Sam, let's get a little bit more. Let's start to get into kind of your story and your journey to start this segment off. I know because you and I know each other personally, in fact, our kids played soccer together many years 10 12 years ago starting 10 12 years oh, yeah. ago oh yeah so uh, we saw each other on the soccer pitch quite often and started to spark up conversations when you were coo at different and different times and merits yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. i remember those days that's crazy yeah yeah, yeah. long and out-of-town tournaments, you would be That's uh, right. Grand Junction or Las Vegas. <laughs> Las Vegas in February freezing. You know? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Anyways, we've known each other for a, a number of years. I know your story quite a bit. And you're somebody that I've always looked up to, admired. Oh, that's kind uh, somebody of that I've always followed because you're genuinely a really great person, a really great leader that has really high care factor and who I've I've learned so much from in my journey that your depth of understanding of business 
and people and leadership and how that all intertwines is, is it is off the charts. There are a lot of people that just simply don't have the acumen that you have on those fronts. And so I followed you, I've learned from you, and I know your Thank journey you. fairly I'm well. humbled by all those comments. Thank yeah. you. That's yeah. very kind of you. My pleasure. And it's no. all absolutely true. Thank you. But I know we're a, a schoolboy in Egypt, born in Egypt. Your family went from Egypt to the UK, ultimately ended up in Utah. You are an immigrant to the United States. You were an immigrant to the UK. May, if you can just give us an overview of your journey from childhood and how that led into the Sam Salem of today as the founder CEO of Mindshare Ventures and Atlas RTX. And just tell us a little bit about that whole story, if you would. I'll, I'll try not to bore everyone, but I was born in Cairo in 1972 to parents that I later appreciated were very unconventional. I didn't know it at the time, but I think I started figuring it out when I became a teenager. So one of my parents was an electrical engineer, and the presumption has always been that that's my dad, but it was actually my mom. My mom was an electrical engineer and was the person who first exposed me to computers. She'd come home with what were called Winchester drives, big, enormous drives in the 70s that you'd stick in IBM machines. And she'd have stacks of computer cards that had the programs on them. And so that was my mom in 1972 in Cairo, Egypt. My father was a colonel in the Egyptian Air Force and the Air Force. And we were raised traditionally for a few years. But when I was four or five, my mother went to Paris to study. And I went with her. And I, we were exposed to the West for the first time. As you mentioned, a few years later, we actually went to the UK and lived there for a year and a half as my dad studied at a war college there, Royal Air Force Academy. And we family lived in, in what seemed like a mansion to me because it was a two-story home, something I'd never seen before. <laughs> and they were just homes that we all got. And suffice it to say, I definitely felt like an immigrant in England. I certainly felt like an immigrant in France. But what was interesting, aside from learning about the West and the opportunities in the West, was when I came back, I felt like an immigrant even in Egypt because I spoke English had become my first language. Our parents had tried to blend and accept and adopt some Western traditions and some Eastern traditions. We obviously completely respect the culture we came from. But I, I remember as a young teenager feeling like I spent my whole freaking life as an immigrant, whether in Egypt or, or otherwise. So when we moved to Salt Lake City in 1986, I was 13, just before my 14th birthday, it, that I had become accustomed to that notion of immigrant. Although I think it was arguably the most jarring immigrant experience. Okay. Salt Lake City in 1986 was even, or it was incredibly uniform. It's much, much less so today. Sure. We lived on campus at the University of Utah student housing, which is now getting, currently getting renovated and so on. But so we were on the east side of town, which was especially uniform, both religiously and ethnically and even socioeconomically. So going to East High School for a few years as an immigrant was tough. It was a very, back then, very preppy school. Again, being a non-Mormon, brown-skinned, immigrant kid who was poor made for made for defining moments for three years in high school i now want to run through because i don't want to just keep telling this boring story but it's not boring suffice it's it absolutely to say, fascinating take your time <laughs> uh, suffice it to say that as immigrants my parents are academics and their perspective to us was education is what will help you create a life here so we were pushed to focus on education. That's all that mattered. Sports are fun, but it's education. Hobbies are fun, but it's education. I, I distinctly remember that. So all of us, including my younger brother and sister, went through the University of Utah. And eventually, I completed four degrees at the university. My not-so-great joke is when you're the kid of a yeah, you're the kid of an immigrant you're supposed to either be a doctor or a professor those are the two paths yeah, yeah in egypt law is not one that we think about certainly not finance so it's doctor or professor my sister became a doctor and i was supposed to be a computer science professor so i was on my path to, to computer science although it was a tough one i it was certainly not a an easy path but then i eventually was able to get an h1b with a local software company in the mid nineties. And that really created my second path where I realized I actually like this industry thing might suit me better. 
And I've been fortunate to build a career here in tech since the mid 90s. And I feel like the luckiest, one of the luckiest people on earth. I did not do anything personally to deserve being able to be in the US. I have many cousins in Egypt who are smarter than me and work harder than me than I would or could, and they're not here. And I think I benefited from the quality and quantity of opportunities in this country. And I think we so often forget how much there is here, how easy, with all due respect, how easy it is if you're just willing to put in some effort to make it in this country. Yeah. I'll stop there because I, I don't want to put everyone to sleep. No, this is all absolutely fascinating. And I, look, you are one of the things I've always admired about you. And one of the things that I connect with other leaders is when leaders who have attained great things learn and know how to still have great humility. And you embody that. So the audience knows you're not, you're not looking at any ordinary guy here. And I know you would say otherwise. But to go through that journey of being an immigrant in three different countries, landing in Utah in an environment that was not really conducive for you, that wasn't overly welcoming to you, and to do very well in your studies, and then to become a senior executive, a C-level executive in some tech companies, some very good-sized tech tech companies and startups, and to transition that into a founder and CEO, right? Those are no small feats. And Thank you. many, many Americans born in America struggle to reach those same feats and those same heights. And so I do want to acknowledge that. And obviously, certainly parents play a role in that, but it's not just about parents. It's about It's about a child who sees a vision and who understands that they want to make something of themselves and do something more meaningful with their life. And But I, I want to come back around a little bit to, and we'll, we'll come back to the story of Mindshare and of Atlas RTX here in just a moment, but you keyed in on something that I am keenly aware of. And I'm keenly aware of it because, and many people in the audience may not know this, but the mother of my three biological boys is Mexican. She immigrated to the United States. We met here in Utah and were later married. My current wife, Angie is Costa Rican. She immigrated to the United States, was in Texas for a number of years, came to Utah. We met after my, my ex-wife and I had divorced and she's Costa Rican, also an immigrant to the United States. My three biological children are Mexican American. Yeah. My three coast, my, excuse me, my two stepchildren are Costa Rican American, both born in Costa Rica. They are immigrants. Of course, my boys were born here, but Absolutely. they are Mexican American. Both of my, you know, my, my ex-wife and my current wife, Angie, they've both, and actually I have a lot of immigrant friends. In fact, for some reason in my journey in my life, I think that I've often connected more with people from outside the U.S. than I have from from native-born yeah, Americans. Yeah. And so I have a lot of friends that are immigrants. And there's this theme that that is always consistent for immigrants, no matter what pinnacles they might reach in this country or their home country, I usually find that most of them feel like, and no matter how long they've been in, in any country, they usually find that they're stuck in no man's land, that they don't really feel like they belong either here or there. They don't belong back home. They don't belong in, you know, in the country where they've immigrated to, in the United States in this case. Can you maybe just expand a little bit on that and how that maybe shows up and plays a role in life? That's a big question, but I appreciate the perspective and you're sharing your own experience there. I think I first really realized it in, er, in the early 80s when the first thing people would ask me, I, I don't, you, you don't see yourself that differently. Your inner eye is the same. You just see yourself like everyone else. But I would immediately get asked where I was from. I would immediately get asked candidly things I remember feeling like it's a pretty personal question. Did you come here for religious reasons or are you religious? Are you of the local religion maybe? And, and I remember just sensing, can I just fit in? Can I just blend in and talk about other things? Because it wasn't a, it was less about insecurity and more about I, it's not what I'm interested in talking about. I'm, it's not my it's not what defines me only although let me candidly tell you that the older i get the more my father's guidance to me as a kid comes true which is the older you get the more you'll appreciate that you are different and i, I sort of sense that in, internally i feel like one's appearance can sometimes get hidden and forgotten for a while and then when something happens suddenly it surfaces so the uh, the story i'll hope i can quickly tell that i hope will make it feel real was uh, i thought I was an American 
by the time the late 90s came about. I had been here for 15 years, uh, early 2000s. I had established myself here. I had a job here. My life was here. I spoke English. I was fortunate to have been here young enough that I could speak it fluently without an accent. And then 9-11 happened. A horrible event. 9-11 was a moment, a critical moment, because instantly those who had been treating me like them started treating me as if I were different. I still remember to this day getting on the plane for the first time. I was a consultant at the time. I traveled all over the country. As we all remember, the skies were shut down for some time. And I remember that first flight going to visit a client and the entire flight completely going silent when I walked in. And admittedly, now that I have a clean shaven head, it's not quite as obvious as when I had my my Egyptian hair, it made it very obvious. And I remember being nervous to go to the bathroom because I didn't want to stand up in the plane. I remember going to a client that happened to be in Texas where uh, at the gate, uh, at the entrance, the security guards had various pictures of Arabs with X's through them, some sort of FBI list or something like that. And giving me a dirty look as I walked in and feeling insecure. So it was almost as if in a matter of a couple of weeks, you remember that your identity is skin deep. Yeah. People suddenly saw me different. That was a really tragic moment for me because it made me realize that could happen at any time. At any time, I could lose that integration. And you're already well into your professional career. You're an executive at this point, or you a senior? Not quite. It happened later. But but yes, I I had a professional career. and Respected. You weren't just anybody and not that I I, I, I'd like to think that anybody Mm. deserves that I I do I agree anybody we shouldn't judge someone by the way they dress or anything else and in many cases certainly one of my common themes is when you ask someone about their identity in the top five or six things they will likely mention their nationality they'll likely mention I'm an American yeah they'll likely mention the religion they were raised with. They might mention some tradition or something like that as part of that identity. And my contention, isn't it strange that we select things that we didn't choose as our own identity? I was born in this country, therefore I'm an American. I was born in a Catholic family, for example. I wasn't, so I'm a Catholic. And those become so core to our identities and we'll fight for them. Yet we didn't choose them, just like the Egyptian didn't choose it, and neither did the Libyan or the French, and so on. So I think it's really strange that we judge people based on the things they don't choose and completely disregard the things they do, their choices in life, their actions, the way they talk, how they treat people, what they achieve in life, what they do and contribute to society. That seems to come second to what we quickly see at a surface level to identify someone. Yeah. You know, these perspectives are so incredibly valuable and the, you got a little emotional. I, I'm getting a little emotional thinking about your experience of 9-11 and suddenly who you are in this country changes and boarding a plane and even being in fear to stand up and go to the restroom because what are people going to think? And is somebody going to try to jump on me or, exactly. yeah, that's a very intense experience. And one that I think many of us who are native to whatever country we're native to in my case the us there's just no way to have a reference point for that and no way to to appreciate that until you hear the stories and you understand and even at that there's no way for us to have lived it and to really connect on the level that you have it's it's more than apparent to me that those experiences have also the deep thought and work that you've done as a result of those experiences have defined you know, the man who stands in front of us today, the leader, the CEO who stands in front of us today. And it's apparent to me that's one of the reasons why you are a leader with deep empathy, Thank a you. leader who sees and understands the humanity in business and people. Sorry. That's something that I value deeply. And it's something that, that often is missing, right, in business. And so I appreciate that in you. I want to acknowledge that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course, buddy. So let's talk a little bit about let's talk a little bit about how that's led to the Sam Salem now coming from 
a successful career and deciding to venture out on your own, right? And do something on your own and forming Mindshare Ventures and how that becomes Atlas RTX. And maybe tell the guests a little bit about what Atlas RTX is and feel free to plug. This is your opportunity to tell the story of your business and the problems you solve. This will feel a lot less emotional, a lot less uh, less sensitive, but I had been fortunate to have built a, a career initially in the, we'll call it mid to late 90s as a software engineer, early 2000s as a consulting and operations manager and director, and then later as a, an operations executive, a COO at, at a few companies. And I think by then I was in my mid 40s and I was having a midlife crisis, appreciating what do my mid 40s, 50s, not that far, and 60s, right around the corner. What do I want to do with my life between now and the end of my career? And I had seen myself as a great number two. I felt like I was great to partner with an entrepreneur. I didn't think of myself as an entrepreneur. I'm not crazy enough. I'm not the visionary, artistic, creative, pie in the sky guy. I'm the spreadsheets and graphs and diagrams and process. I mean, I'm boring. Engineer minded and engineer minded. The immigration, the, the background of immigration probably, maybe I'm speaking out of term, no, but no. maybe makes you a little more risk averse. Actually, very good point. Yeah. Very good yeah. point. In fact, my biggest fear about taking a leap out of this traditional path where I was being rewarded was what am I going to tell my immigrant parents who gave up everything for me to now be in this fancy white collar job being paid tons of money with a big team and assistants. And I almost felt guilty. Like, um, why would you quit that? Why would you give up what you've been able to achieve? And I really felt I was afraid. Yeah. Even as someone in my mid forties, I was afraid to tell my parents, but my wife who has not just been my best friend, but my, the one who has constantly told me it was possible and believed in me positioned it as why don't you do something for a year? Just take one year of time. And this is the best piece of advice that I was ever given. Nothing is forever. Just think of it as a chapter. And at the end of the year, you can revisit and do something else. So I decided that for one year, I would do what I was really passionate about. And what I was really passionate about is that inner professor in me came out and I loved coaching and mentoring younger ops folks. My specialty was operations and product. So I thought I'll spend a year just being a consultant, potentially working for free if they couldn't afford to pay me. And if they could afford to pay me, I'll make it nominal. Excuse me. And I'm going to form Mindshare Ventures and I'm going to leverage other, let's call them seasoned (laughs) executives from in finance, in uh, CTOs, a variety of chief product officers. And I'd bring these folks with me and we'd go help entrepreneurs succeed. That was really the genesis behind Mindshare Ventures. But I very quickly realized, one, I'm only working 30, 40 hours a week and I'm an immigrant. I need to work 50 or 60 to feel like I'm busy. And second, I felt in a sincere way, imposter syndrome, because I had never been an entrepreneur, yet I was advising a 28-year-old entrepreneur with zero revenue. I'm an eight, $10 million guy and take it from there in revenue, eight to 10 million in revenue and up. Yeah. So I'd done that multiple times. Yeah. And so I thought, all right, if my, if what I am doing and all the guidance and frameworks that I'm building are any good, I should be able to create, incubate a company within Mindshare Ventures and actually have it succeed. So that was the intention behind Atlas, mm-hmm. believe it or not. And the A is the first company. The name was not even, I need to come up with a really cool story for the genesis of the name. But that was really, let me build a company and do it the right way. Let me have it be about people in a real sense. Let me bring in co-founders. Let me not get on a financial, what do you call it? Treadmill, a financial treadmill where we raise money too early and then blow up in 18 months. And let me really do it right. And then use it as a role model for future mindshare ventures and for future guidance. And I would now suddenly, oops, sorry about hitting a mic. I will now suddenly have firsthand experience. And that was really the genesis of the story. And after year one, we had hit the milestones and my wife jumped in and we kept going. And we have now, this is year seven. We have a great team here in Park City and we have amazing clients, Fortune, many Fortune 500 companies. I'm actually proud to say that, I'm sorry we didn't correct it beforehand, we were at seven out of the top 20 
builders, for example, we're up to 10. Wow. And we have a number of other higher ed institutions that we support, <clears throat> including Emory University and Fordham. So we've got, we've built some, we've built a really cool company. I'm really proud. That's, that's amazing. And thank you. To have that level of client is a significant accomplishment, right? Thank um, you. Oftentimes it takes startups much longer than seven years to, to get to that point. You start taking down the smaller opportunities first and then work your way upstream. And then we're still in that process in SMB through SME at Nexus IT. And we're starting Absolutely. to look at our enterprise plays. And that's 24 years in. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could do it for 24 years. That's impressive. Yeah. I, I now have an appreciation for how hard, how hard being an entrepreneur is. So I sincerely have empathy, appreciation for you. The, I think those of us who are in the field, shall we say operators working for a company that's venture backed or PE backed or whatever, yeah. I think we think of ourselves as entrepreneurial. This is a hard job being a COO or a CTO. It's a hard job. Is it really that much harder to be your own entrepreneur? My goodness, it's not even close. Yeah. The burden that you as an entrepreneur carry, the loneliness that everyone talks about but no one appreciates until you're there yeah. the sense of helplessness sometimes and the sense of overwhelm sometimes and now understand that experienced it it's so much easier <laughs> to yeah. be a coo at a 200 million dollar company yeah it, and i that's one of the things about your story and your journey and i know you spoke about this i've seen you speak about this uh, on more than one occasion that there's a significant difference in being a hired executive and being the entrepreneur, founder, investor, your wow, money good on for, the line, yes, right? exactly. and CEO yeah. of the organization. Maybe just talk a little bit more about that and how that's been so much different and what you've learned a little bit there. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that. That's actually one of the principles I'm really passionate about is this epiphany that as founder, I want to be, the metaphor I'll use is the grandpa. I just want to be nice to everybody and take the kids out to coffee and ice cream. I'm not coffee, ice cream. I'm a coffee guy, mm. coffee, but take them to ice cream and pat them on the back and be the kind, supportive, only positive person. That's what a founder seeks. And I'm sure you Absolutely. understand that. Yeah. A CEO, it's a tough job. A CEO, you have to be the parent to continue the metaphor. You have to be the parent. Someone has to say no. I know that would make everybody happy, but it's the wrong thing for the company. Yeah. And that's a tough role. That's a tough role. And now how do you balance being the parent with this desire to be the grandparent? You can't do it concurrently. Wouldn't it be nice if I could be the grandparent, I could let someone else be the parent. And that's only significantly more amplified when you're bootstrapping out of your own pockets. Which then brings us to the third role, <laughs> yeah. which I now have a sincere appreciation for. As an investor, I'm just going to be, I think we've seen the style here. I'm going to be blunt about it and transparent. As an investor, you're essentially, I don't want to call it on the other side of the table, but you're on, you're, you're, your objectives are to optimize and maximize the enterprise value of what you're building. And to do that, you have to put a lot of pressure on the CEO and therefore on everyone else on the team. And it's a very different thing. It's less about all the soft, fluffy leadership stuff we all talk about and more dollars and cents. And that is hard. Every dollar you spend is a dollar. You, I'm sure you remember the early days in your business. I still remember writing a check from our family's checkbook. Yeah. That's uh, that we didn't have payroll yeah. and you pay the person and you're like, did I just wow, that's a big check. Am I getting that kind of value yeah. out of it? And that tension suddenly really puts a different perspective on things. So you combine being an investor with being the CEO, with being the founder, and we have got a serious problem. It's yeah. really <laughs> tough to balance it all. Yeah, yeah. It's a wonder we don't all go insane. It's, you know? <laughs> it's true. It's multiple personality disorder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure my team feels this way. Yeah. Which Bassam are we getting today? Which is it going to be the grandpa, the parent, or, uh, and I don't know what the metaphor for the investor would be. But. Yeah. And really for the founders that are joining us out there, first of all, we understand this dynamic and the, the journey. I've been on it for almost 24 years, Bassam now for seven. And just first of all, th this is why the, the power of a circle a power of a network, a power of friends. The Sam and I, every now and again on a Saturday morning, we'll grab coffee, 
sit down, just, just commiserate with each other. Talk give about each other it. a hug. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I know you do that with a lot of founders, which I appreciate that you you extend your open arms to other people to help founders in their journey and, and to navigate some of the difficult waters. And maybe for those that aren't founders out there, we try our best. None of us are perfect. And I think most founders that I know deeply are good people in their hearts and they're trying to produce the right outcomes for everybody and the right experiences for everybody. And sometimes you just can't make the stars align exactly how you want. You can't be the grandparent all exactly, the time. Exactly. And that is a difficult place for us to be in. So, you know, what I'm saying is cut us some slack sometimes <laughs> because it, the, the, the pressure is real. And frankly, there are times where many of us are on the edge of breakdowns. And I've had dear friends who have had very severe breakdowns because of the pressure. Absolutely. When you are, when it's your money, you're bootstrapping it. You're the founder, you're the CEO, or you're one of the senior execs, and you're part of that founding team. It's it's no joke. It's difficult. You're absolutely right. So, you know, which by the way, this conversation, you and I could go on for hours, I think. And your story and your journey is so fascinating to me. And I think of so much value for so many. And I know we've taken a, a good amount of time. In fact, we're about 40 minutes in right now. But I do want to shift a little bit and talk a little bit about how your journey has lended to your appreciation for de and i diversity equity and inclusion in the workplace and you know let's talk a little bit about that first and then we'll talk more about the impacts of that and why it why is it important if it is right so maybe just yeah Appreciate that first that. part of that first yeah at some points i think it was in my mid to late 30s i realized that there were a couple of key moments in my life where a single person made a decision that made it possible for me to be here. So there are two people I want to public, publicly recognize. The first was, it was 1993. I was finishing my CS degree at the University of Utah. I graduated. I did pretty well. I wasn't at the very top of the class, but I did pretty well. I thought I could go to graduate school in computer science at the U. And I should be able to get in because I, after all, graduated there and I was a pretty good student. Suffice it to say, I was utterly devastated when the University of Utah rejected my application. And um, I, was, I went into the graduate advisor and asked, hey, what, what happened? I'm a pretty good student. Look at my grades and my references. And she explained that because I'm a foreign student, I'm on an F1 visa, I get evaluated against a completely different pool than American students. And after all, we're a state university, and I love the University of Utah, by the way, and in fact, honored to be on the board now, so I love the university. But Congrats. that was a, thank you, that was a shock to me. I, I, <clears throat> yeah. uh, and compared to all of the immigrants who were applying, I was not that great, I was just okay. So I was rejected. And a professor by the name of Lee Holler, who had taught me a couple of classes, heard of my plight. I didn't approach him. He heard of it. He called me into his office and said he was going to do something about it. And that if I would work for him this summer, 90, the summer of 93, that he would see what he could do. I worked my butt off that summer because he gave me a chance of a lifetime. And it's thanks to him that I didn't lose my visa. And I wasn't, wouldn't, I would have been forced to go home. My visa would be, and suffice it to say, Lee Holler changed this person's life. He could have given it to any kid for whom it wouldn't have made a difference, but because he gave it to me, it made a difference. I'm not going to repeat a similar lengthy story later in my career, but at one point as a good technologist, I thought of myself as an individual contributor and one who would become rock star individual contributor at 50, not a leader, mm -hmm. because candidly, those of us who were computer scientists and who were immigrants were always seen back then as individual contributors. Back then, there were no Indian CEOs of tech firms mm -hmm. like we have today. That didn't occur. We were stereotyped. We were siloed. And Michael Resnick at Siebel Systems, who first said, yes, Sam, I think you could be a leader. I'm going to put you in this role and have you be my right hand. And I'm so grateful for Michael Resnick because he taught me I could be a manager. I wasn't great at it, yeah. but I, I could do it. So now we jump forward and realize, oh my gosh, 
these people can change other people's lives. So for me, DE&I is not about how does that help a business or why our business is going to do better. Who the hell cares? Pardon my language. That's not what's important. What's important is what's the right thing to do. Do we owe it to people to give them a chance? Do people deserve a chance? People who want to work hard, do they deserve a chance? That in and of itself is enough for me. Do I believe it does help a business? Absolutely. Who wants to work in a business where everybody looks the same and talks the same and believes the same? Yes. Do I believe, therefore, that those businesses will do better? Yes. But that is not the reason I do it. And today I'm so incredibly passionate about it because of my own experience. I want to be the Lee Holler or the Michael Resnick for others. I want to be the person who gave people a chance. And you you have been, by the way. You you. have been. And I've seen that in your journey. In fact, <clears throat> Again, this your life experience has created this deep empathy for humanity and a deep en- empathy for potentially the underdog. And I've seen that actually in the way you recruit, in the way you look for interns, in in the ideals and core values of your organization and your four H's. Thank yeah. you. What are your four H's? There's hungry, happy, happy humble, yeah. hungry, and horsepower. Okay, happy, happy humble, hungry, and horsepower. horsepower. Yeah, that's what you look for. And I know that when you find a candidate that embodies that you're not overly concerned about their experience and their background and their education. And you, those four things are the qualifiers. And from there, you will take them under your wing and under your team's wing and teach those people and, and give them a chance. Absolutely. And I sincerely, while they sound like nice marketing characters, I really believe in them. I think, and I'm more so today than I ever did. If we really distill it down, I really believe that those four ingredients define the perfect person you want to bring into a team any type of team. Happy people are not toxic. They're grateful. Happy people are uh, bring up the energy in the room instead of bringing it down. It doesn't take many unhappy people to destroy a culture. Humble people. No one needs a know-it-all. No one cares. I don't need a know-it-all because they're not, they're going to be the same person next year as they were last year. So I want humble people, even if they don't know much today, humility will allow them to grow. And then hungry you're a founder. I'm a founder. The bar is high when you are building a team. I don't need to build a lifestyle business. I don't need to build a lifestyle team. I want people who want to be all in and grow. And this is what they're focused on. This is what they want to do. And those folks are few and far between. So when we find them, we give them a chance. Horsepower, I leave to the end because candidly, horsepower is one that in most cases is innate. And I don't like that about it because it's the one trait that is really hard to change in someone. We meet people with incredible horsepower and you're like, if you can add those other three attributes, nothing will stop you. So happy, humble, hungry horsepower. The interesting thing is if all you is, if all you have is horsepower and you don't have those other three traits, you're probably not the right fit to really join a growth minded team in in a significant growth sort of business. Exactly. And I've seen with your journey, you do these summer internships specifically with immigrants. And remind me the criteria there. I know there's a criteria of, go ahead. If well, you no, so we, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. We have a number of programs. The first is really for high school students who are immigrants and hoping to go to college who may not be exposed to what's working in the business world is they may not have had that opportunity. Their parents may have never been able to expose them to it. So we love bringing in what we call our Salem scholars, but we give them up scholarship towards their university education and we expose them to what sales is like what marketing is like what engineering is like so they can have perspective before they go to college but likewise i'm really proud to say that over the last couple of years we've now aired what we call apprentices post-college and we have a number of them with us uh, started with us who are folks who came like me as foreign students and finished an MBA at the U or a master's in finance or something like that, and who need someone to help sponsor them beyond that. So despite our small size, we will take happy, humble, hungry folks from any country who have graduated here and who need someone to give them a chance. So we do have that as well. Yeah. It's so cool to see a leader and a team who has taken a very mindful approach to how you create a positive impact that's beyond just providing employment and a paycheck and a 40 hour work week, but how do you really spread your net wider, do something meaningful for people? Thank you. I see that. I acknowledge it and I honor it. So thanks uh, very much. Thank you for, for being that type of leader, that type of individual. It it is, 
it's commendable. Thank you. And yeah. others were that for me. So I really feel it's only fair, but I, I, I've been given so many chances. Yeah. Maybe uh, let's talk, and we've got about 10 minutes left here. By the way, Diane Moore, who's joining us, says she loves the four H's, and so do uh, I. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Diane. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I, if you're not following a Sam on, on LinkedIn or any other social mediums, do it because I, I learned so much from you. Oh, I, I really do. <laughs> and you, you've always got nuggets that are just like, why didn't I think of that? No. I'm 24 years into this <laughs> thing. Why didn't I think of that? Let's go back just a little bit. You arrive in Utah as an Im immigrant in very much white picket America, very much a religious community that you and your family were not part of. You were immediately, and I don't want to use the term incorrectly, but you were immediately outsiders, right? In the community. And maybe let's talk more about where you are today and where the, your hometown that you live in now, Park City here. Tell us a little bit about maybe the role of diversity and inclusion in community, not just business, and what that means to you. Oh, I appreciate that. Maybe I'll have to try to connect it personally. One, in an attempt to integrate when we came here, one of the things I'm really proud of about my parents is, yes, we should immigrate. Yes, we should go and challenge ourselves and grow elsewhere. But no, we shouldn't just take everything that we have with us and force it into the new world. Let's take and keep the best of what we have and let's integrate here. So I'm really proud of that approach because I think it allowed us to be open, less defensive about things and more willing to adopt. One of the things that I, in some part, in some ways I regret is my parents allowed us to take on Western names, should we call them, Western names for professional reasons here. So I picked the name Mark from a TV show I liked, and my younger brother picked Steve Austin, Six Million Dollar Man, <laughs> another TV show. And my sister happened to be a Maggie already, so she didn't need a Western sounding name. But I distinctly remember, I distinctly remember sending out resumes as Bassam Salem versus resumes as Mark Salem. When I'd send resumes, by the way, as Bassam Salem, suddenly it was Bassam Salem. Mm. When it was Mark Salem, suddenly it was just Mark Salem. I would get interviews eight times out of 10 under the Mark moniker. I would almost never hear back under the Bassam moniker. And that, that was distinctive for me because it was uh, taught me how the world worked. Yeah. And I regret that it took me until 2002 when my son was born to do away with my dual identity and go back to the Sam. So now going to your, the, the question you asked is how important is diversity in a community? And I really believe that we need to find a good way for folks who come overseas to bring the richness and color and energy of their local place. And we should accept them and let them exercise that. But I also think it's fair of them to hold themselves accountable to needing to integrate, to trying to integrate. And it's tough to put that bar on the immigrant because in some cases, the environment around them is not accepting. So they're forced to just go find people like them who will accept them. Wouldn't it be great if we could get the best of both worlds where there is acceptance and people could blend in and we could really create these melting pots. It creates really vibrant communities. Let's get the best of everybody. And, and bring it together. And I hope we can create places where no matter the spelling of your name or hard, how hard it is to pronounce or where you come from or how you dress, that we can just bring the richness in and integrate it. Yeah. There's so much there, so many very wonderful points. I think for me, the thing that I want to wrap up here and then maybe just a, a final question as we wind down the hour here, but that is that whether it's business or whether it's community, you said it earlier, in, in looking at diversity, looking at people of unique backgrounds, unique orientation, unique colors, whatever it might be. First of all, recognizing the humanity in each one of us and just doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. A good friend of mine, a musician that I've lost contact with, sadly, mm -hmm. and I, I need to re reconnect there, but he used to say we're all five finger beings. Right? We're the same. You take the skin off and we are the same. Besides that, me, variety, is the richness of life taking all of those ethnic and cultural traditions that are so and we've lost so much of that in the us we're a melting pot right and so 
we've lost some of those really unique, deep cultural traditions that are so beautiful when you travel and you go other places and you see the heart and soul of people that are so deeply connected to a culture that dates thousands of years back. That's beautiful, for one. Two, as tech leaders in Utah, I know many of us, and not just tech leaders, but many business leaders in Utah, are champions of diversity. We are trying to create, not just within our organizations, but within the community, an environment where all can thrive and where fairness and equity is a given for all, right? Because it does make for a more beautiful, thriving community and a more a business that thrives, right? Diversity of thought, diversity of background, bring more voices to the table that help solve more problems quicker. Absolutely. So I, I want to thank you for, of course, sharing your life story and how these concepts all have played a role. As we wind down the hour, again, just want to thank you for being my distinguished guest, for being a friend. Thank you. For thank you for yours. Being a mentor directly or indirectly. I think you're a mentor to many people you don't even know you're a mentor to. But the fact that you're thank willing you. to take the time on mostly a daily basis to share some thoughts right online and put yourself out there put your heart and soul out there which isn't easy i know i'm an introvert and, and I'm, I'm not as good at doing daily as i once was just nexus it is in, in a very aggressive growth mode right now and, and right. yeah and i oftentimes don't have the time to to put some thoughts out there every single day but and i do want to get to one more question and we'll go over the hour just a, a few minutes but I, I wanted to thank mallory lovestad who's our director of marketing uh, behind the camera today making sure that everything's working so thank you mallory yeah, appreciate you sure. being here with us and smiling at us from time to time i appreciate <laughs> it <laughs> yeah. anyways just a final question this this very intriguing journey you've been on from egyptian schoolboy to France to UK to the United States to engineer to executive, senior executive to founder, investor, CEO. What do you think is the greatest lesson you've learned? And it can be life or business. What's the greatest <laughs> lesson you've learned? And what would you like to share with the audience that you think would be of value as some parting words? I'll keep it brief and I'll go to the four H's again. I think seeing so many high horsepower friends and acquaintances and colleagues over now decades not achieve their desired potential, what they wanted to achieve. The missing ingredient tended to be humility. Very smart people always think they're right, even though they might be wrong a little bit at the time, but that little bit is what distinguishes making it and optimizing from not. So I think for myself, I'm constantly trying to, at the end of the day, ask myself, what things am I not being humble about? What things did someone tell me today that, that might actually be right, even though I disagree with it? And I struggle with that because it's tough. You can't spend all of your time doubting yourself, but you have to spend enough time to make sure that you're improving. And I will tell you, there have been both personal and business positions that I have changed as recently as this year, my take on. Meaning I used to hold this philosophy and I now need to be humble enough to say I was wrong. And I do that, I did it in a meeting just before I came here where I told the team, when you first suggested this to me, I wanna acknowledge, I told you guys, I don't think this is a good idea. I was wrong. You guys are right. And I'm glad you pushed me to, uh, to appreciate that. So. I think I'll leave it at that, but focus on humility because I think it's a tough one. Yeah, that's such great wisdom and, and advice there. And as an effective leader, most definitely, in fact, yesterday I was in two meetings where I had to say I was wrong and I'm sorry. And that that is, and I specifically know business leaders that would say that humility is a severe weakness in business. I like you believe that humility is a superpower. Being able to understand and know that I'm not right 100% of the time, I'm not, I'm just human. And my way isn't always the only highway. And that's why you surround yourself with amazing, talented people who care and, you know, who again, bring diverse voices to the table Absolutely. so that you can understand where your blind spots are and why there might, why your perspective may not be 100% accurate or just needs to shift. So take that home for all the founders that are with us or all the leaders that are with us. Humility is a superpower. And Basam Salem said it, so it's yeah. true. <laughs> uh, yeah. Look, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to have my esteemed guest and friend, Basam Salem, with me today. Before thank we you. go, though, yeah. I want to thank you for the positive energy 
that you always bring every time I've ever met you, everywhere you go, and for being the guy I can count on because there have been multiple occasions where I've reached out to you for help and you've immediately been the person to jump in and say, I'm here for you. And I think that's uh, that says a lot. So thank you for always being that for me over the years. I really appreciate that. That's very good. Again, we thank you all so much. Remember that we've got some really amazing segments of TechBeat coming up with some other really fantastic leaders. Tune in for those. Look for you know, the announcements on those. We're going to go ahead and sign off here of TechBeat today. Thanks for joining us. We're out.